Patrick Bateman. Peter Michaels. Episode 13. 13. Right, you were worried about this Lucky one. Lucky 13. I don't know what's going to happen here. So Anything could happen. I want to paint a picture. It is a third Wednesday evening in Red Deer, Alberta. Yeah. <clears throat> we are in the communal creative studios. Um, I don't believe it's countrywide, but I, I saw half of our country, I think, is under a pretty... Big heat wave across the West for sure. Yes, definitely. What was I think when I got here it was thirty seven degrees, which Alberta temperature is pretty hot. Was it that high? In my car. So I don't know like what how that how accurate it is. But yep. um So we're still not near the like the what's the the town in BC's broken the record like two, three days I didn't in a row. See that really yeah, like crazy. Forty six the like the hottest temperature ever in Canada. There's a little town in BC. Well, you you texted me the other night, and you you specifically asked me about the heat. I think because I, over the years, even on a hot day, you're pretty steaming in your house, right? I uh, I run warm. Um, I I live in not only a basement suite, but also uh, a building that is air conditioned, <laughs> and uh, I kind of like this heat. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, don't get me wrong. I will take the plus thirty five over the minus thirty five any oh, yeah. day of the week. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also a larger dude and. Uh, a little glistening right now. Oh, I'm clammy as all hell. Uh, we do have Riley put together. You built something like this a couple of years ago. I remember, Pete. Uh, it's a a cooler with a couple of holes oh, in yeah. it. There's <laughs> the redneck fan. The redneck fan. So there is a fan built into the top of the cooler. Riley, is that how it works? Yeah, I built it in there. Yeah. Okay, and then there's it, the the fan sucks in the air into the cold cooler, and then it's expected to shoot out the the bottles. Yeah. Yeah. Is it working? Uh, the AC, we do have AC in this building. About a week ago, Ryan and Riley were like, yeah, we got a heat wave coming. This is going to be a great place to be. And uh, sure enough, this morning, this morning, yeah. the AC broke and is not expected to be fixed for about a week. It's fair to say about a week. I believe that's on you for commenting last week about how great it's going to be for the upcoming meeting. Okay, fair enough. No, that's definitely on you. Um, now, that being said, today, it would be a bad day to be in a porta potty you think? Yes, I do. They're pretty warm. They get very, very warm. I don't know. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sure we've all been into porta potty on a hot, sunny day. Kind of traps yeah, heat. But usually after you've had a few, like you're at a music festival. Right. You've had a so few. So if you're under you the influence. It. You're under the influence. You don't notice it nearly You're falling into the wall. <laughs> um, you're reaching in to grab some cool. Never mind. But I, I, I do want to talk to our friend Dustin at Go Services. Um, if there's any air conditioning technology that's entered the porta potty game in the last five or ten years, those would be some high tech porta potties. I mean, it doesn't have to be. Maybe it's just a vent to like an easy scientific vent system. You could easily have like a little fan, like in a trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's got to be little tiny AC units. Yeah, little tiny AC. And this is something, and I'm I'm dying to meet this guy. I know you know him. I'm dying to meet him because that's what I want to talk about is the advance. You got an idea. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well. So, Dustin, I got this idea about porta potties. Yeah, yeah. Heat waves. I'm sure he's heard them all. Shout out to them. Who else are we uh, shouting out today? Well, if uh, you're going to have a 36 degree day, you're going to have a beer or two. Hazy Blonde Ale. Maybe the East Coast Pale Ale. What is your go? Like, what is your your style? Uh, IPAs. Like the- West Coast, New England. Uh, I don't know. It says IPA on it. <laughs> Well, I did. Luckily, I did have a bit of a panic attack the other day when I thought my favorite IPA uh, had been discontinued because I haven't seen it on the shelves in literally like two months. But uh, I don't think that's accurate. So we can talk about that off mic. Um, I need your insight. Sawback Brewery has <laughs> some great West Coast mm-hmm. IPAs. I like. I like that one. Right, I've had yeah. their theirs before. And their Irish Red Ale is pretty fantastic. They've got a. They do a, a, a great uh, a great uh, job over there. A shout out to Red Deer Tourism. And Bo's Bar and Stage. Now, we're, we're uh, on the verge of, like, fully opening up here in Alberta. Fully. Right? Yes. As of, so we're recording this on Wednesday before Canada Day. Right. Tomorrow is. Is the day when the, 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 the gates open. That's um, it. So, and, and I have not been uh, paying too, too much attention to the news lately. But today, can you explain to me what today was in the broadcasting world? Yeah, uh, today was a day to listen. That's what it's called. So that's what it's called. And so radio stations uh, on Wednesday, June thirtieth, mm-hmm. across the country, mm-hmm. uh, basically, I mean, still did their kind of somewhat regular programming, uh, but ran uh, segments all throughout the day, giving a voice to Indigenous people. So telling so like the story in- of yes. Okay, so interview segments. Interview segments. So uh, you know, for example, the uh, the woman who had started the Orange Shirt Day 
came on and she did a five minute segment about why she had started Orange Shirt Day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, lots of other people had told their stories about you know uh, grandparents and even parents. You know, we're yeah. talking just a generation, not you know a generation ago, less uh, than that, fifty years ago. That in the some residential cases, schools right? yeah. were in place, so a lot of people still feeling the effects of that, mm-hmm. uh, and just getting some pretty deep stories uh, on that. So, and it was great to see. Yeah, radio stations right across the country jumped on board. Very cool. So uh, throughout the day, like you said, interview segments, were there any specific music uh, bits throughout the day or? No, it was all kind of centered around the uh, kind of the interview segments okay. and getting the stories out. Very cool. Well, that's a good initiative. And then they're raising money for the D- Downey, Downey Wenjack, Wenjack fund. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you could text a number and $10 uh, goes to Downey Wenjack. Cool. That's awesome. Now I'm curious in furthering that discussion, could you explain to me the the orange shirt origin story? You're really expecting a lot out of me here. You don't have I don't to explain anything. Uh, no, as I recall it, it um, I can't remember if it was the woman herself or if it was a family member. You know, I want to say it was her herself, but forgive me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but went to the residential school wearing an orange shirt that mm-hmm. she was super proud of and loved, and they made her take it off at the residential school, and she never got to see that shirt again. That's like the bare bones story of it, mm-hmm. but that's k- kind of how that how it started. Hmm. All right. Well, it was a, yeah, it was uh, a tough day to listen, but a good day to listen as well because we need to hear these stories. And you, several of those stories have talked about how in indigenous uh, households these things have been talked about for decades. Yeah, I saw actually an old uh, school friend of mine. He had made a post about growing up hearing like campfire stories that had been, you know, uh, shared down the generation lines. And and they were very specifically, uh, you know, scary campfire slash horror stories meant to spook the kids. And now that these stories are coming out more and more, you realize that, yeah, they're just born out of truth. It's not some fairy tale bullshit. It's uh, an unfortunate unfortunate representation of our. Our past. So, and and in in uh, speaking about that, um, I would, you know, I really and I, man, I really wish we got to talk to him about it more. And someday we will. But Zachary Gray from the Solas, right. what episode is that? Uh, uh, that was eight. Eight. Uh, he he goes a little bit into, um, his, what's the word? His evolution uh, in patriotism. Yeah. Over the years and under uh, realizing as you grow grow older that a lot of those. Um, Things that you, you found make the foundation of your patriotism are built on mistru- mistruths, as he said, um, which is a, a sentiment that is I've been struggling with for a long time now. Well, and, and the a lot of people that, are now the line, and I think it, you know, it probably was around long before Gore Downey uh, had kind of brought a lot of this to light. But we're not the country we thought we were. Yeah, is mm-hmm. it, you can't sum it up any any better than that. Yeah, and you can't change that. That's just how it is. That's just how it is. <laughs> So if you're not researched, then do your research. It's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. Um, all we right. Sh- we should mention, and we haven't talked about this very much either, but if, yeah, that episode with Zach is great to go back and listen to for some of that stuff, episode eight, but maybe this is the first listen you've had of the Road the Stage podcast. Mm-hmm. So this is episode 13. We've had uh, some great guests uh, running a mix of genres of music and like we say, kind of across the country, uh, go back through the bars, uh, the bars, the Bose Barn Stage YouTube. Yes. Watch uh, some of the previous episodes. Check them out on our uh, our link tree as well. Yeah, man. We've had, uh, we've had, like alt we've had straight up rock right yep we've had some country we've had some roots some some folk folksy roots um and now we've had some hardcore this is uh this those, is gonna be a hardcore chat yeah for sure liam cormier from the cancer bats on uh the road the stage we were uh ryan was kind of telling us uh, months ago about his connection to you and the bats and even more so like your your connection to red deer is is uh it's a good thing it's a positive thing right i would i would use the word legendary crazy okay <laughs> yeah we've been going to red deer since like our very first tour really yeah in 2000 that started at, we got linked started at the vat B-Rad. would the vat have been the first place he played or do you remember the venues uh I feel like the first place that we played was the college. Okay. okay. Yep. Um, but me, or maybe it was B Rad would know this. He, he probably has a better grasp on it, but uh, yeah, we either played the VAT first or we played the college, but they were both like really close together. 
Man, that's cool. 2006. I mean, that's a lot. You guys are closing in. Are you ready to say 20 years almost? No. No? Just 20? 15? Well, a few years from 20. Like, is was 2006 the first year we're of more the like cancer at the 15 year mark? I would say. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's good to know. But I mean, uh, I've never seen I've never seen you guys live. I don't think um, I think since I've lived in Red Deer, which has only been a few years, you've had a, at least a couple of shows that I've unfortunately missed. But uh, what was the last, what, the last one was like two years ago, three years ago. Do you remember Probably that would have been two years at Bose? I'm guessing was the last one. The last one was in 2019 and it was at the um, the beer hall. Yeah, the beer, hall, which doesn't exist anymore. Oh. Right. Oh, no. Oh, no. no. Yeah. No. Dude, that show was bananas. I mean, I would say in Red Deer's defense, all shows that we play there, like that's why we keep coming back. Because the shows are just the best. Like it's carnage always. So we're learning about, uh, I've learned a few things about Red Deer and the kind of music that it enjoys over the years. I'm now learning that the cancer not, have uh, a pretty dedicated base here. I'm still not recording, guys. Oh, you're not oh, recording. You're not recording. No, my oh, is, uh, what? My computer's fucking recording. Amateur yeah. hour. <laughs> Can you hear him, Liam? No, what no you said? can't hear Ryan. No, we should all be able to hear each other, right? Liam, you can hear me. I can, I can hear, hear you. you now. Yeah. Let me, I might turn you guys up. Go for it. No, um well I'll, I'll save that thought then <laughs> yeah we're gonna have to start all over again when so, did you uh it's how long have you been out in halifax when did i move here yeah uh just in 2019 so the end of the touring cycle for cancer rats okay uh like the end of that last record we had some time off and i had been hanging out uh on the east coast and specifically halifax like a bunch and i was like I'm going to move here. This place mm -hmm. is amazing. And then I did. And what was it specifically about? Like city, people, scene? Yeah, all of it. I mean, the city is is awesome. It's really close to tons of like, obviously the ocean, but also tons of lakes and nature and all this great stuff like basically 20 minutes in any direction is the most beautiful scenery you've ever seen in your life so that was appealing um i also love to ride uh dirt bikes and mm -hmm. street bikes and anything to do with motorcycles uh yep. and there's a huge scene out here for that so that was why i was coming out here all the time in the first place um was for my clothing brand treadwell I was doing lots of pop-ups and I was like selling to a lot of stores. So I was already like coming out to like New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And I was like, this is so sick. And then I met this really uh, red lady out here. <laughs> and then I was like, oh. there it is. So then that was like in, um, yeah, 2018, 2019. I was like out here pretty much like all the time, just between Toronto and then by the end of like 2019, I was like, yeah, I'm going to move out here. And then I very quickly found a house and was like, man, I'm going to buy a house out here. It sounds awesome. Are you going to go full like protest the hero and write, write a song about Halifax? I think they did one about St. John's, right? Do you know that? Oh, yeah, yeah. See, we did that. We wrote a song about Winnipeg. Oh, OK, Winnipeg. right. It's on right. our last record. So we already did it. <laughs> One city. That's they're a one city band. Just a full Cancer Bats album of just like city themed tracks. I may, yeah. I don't know. I feel like it might get too corny. Yeah, I think so too. You so know? we're we're rolling now. So we'll just we'll probably join this in progress so we can keep get everybody up to speed. We're just we're talking to Liam about moving out to Halifax mm -hmm. uh, and getting the, uh, no, the magical place on on why Halifax? Why not Halifax? I guess. Yeah, I mean, really, why not? Have you like um, have you embraced the food scene out there? Oh yeah, it's killer as well. What what's what's There's something that of, it's it's interesting too because um I feel like a lot of Canada has had this happen. Um where people went to Toronto and Montreal and Vancouver and all these places and were like, Oh, you know what? Like the thing I wanna open up or start would require me to like partner with you know people and it would take all this capital 
Mm. Maybe I'll just go back to my hometown and do that. So there's like people who then are moving back to, you know, Winnipeg and all these places and opening up these like rad restaurants. So like with influence from obviously the rest of the country and then opening up these like really cool spots. So I feel like I also came to Halifax at a time when there was like tons of new stuff like opening and yeah, the food scene here is killer. And what are the winters like? Oh, so breezy. Yeah. Yeah, because we're right by the ocean. So it's actually warmer here than it is in Toronto. Nice. You're not getting so, like Newfoundland winters there, are you? Or is it pretty similar? No, like I shoveled my driveway like three times last winter. Right. Like I barely needed snow tires. Actually, on those days, I just didn't even leave because I was like, man, they're just going to plow the streets tomorrow and then there won't be any snow. And then so when you're like when things get rolling again and and I'm assuming you're going to be spending more time in Toronto because the rest of the band are in Ontario, right? No. So that's the thing. So Mikey, our drummer, moved to Winnipeg. Oh, wow. In 2014, because that's where he's from. Him and his wife are both from there. So they had a chance to buy a house and start a family. And so they did. So he has two kids and he lives in Winnipeg. So that's also why we spend a lot of time in Winnipeg and why I write songs about Winnipeg. <laughs> but uh, we actually recorded our last record uh, in Winnipeg. And we plan on going back to Winnipeg to re- record uh, another album, Ooh, an ju- upcoming album. Juicy, juicy tidbit. You heard it here first, Red Deer. <laughs> what do you think? Because the band is at a, a spot where it's established enough, you guys can kind of divide and conquer a little bit. Like, do you do you think it's necessary to be in a place like Toronto or Vancouver if you're kind of just getting started and rolling? I think, yeah, I do think that there's something to be said about being in a major city when you're young and you're grinding and you want to be kind of like caught up in that kind of vibe like I definitely like owe a lot to Toronto for like the hustle and like yeah being in the like I was at our record label like every single day that I was home like I would show up every day and be like what are we doing okay what do I gotta do you know and I just like made cancer bats like a priority for distort like I was like oh you signed the gorgeous that's sick okay what are we doing (laughs) That's really sick. This record is sick, but we're working on Cancer Rats right now. Let's go. And then that was at the same time that the Bedlam office, like who manages um, like City and Color and Alexis on Fire, mm. they shared offices too. So I was like talking to them all the time and like, yeah, it was just like a really great spot to be. Um, so I think, yeah, when you're like 20 and you're grinding and you need it, but I also think there's something to be said about like recognizing when you don't need to grind anymore Mm -hmm. (laughs) maybe not maybe not that we don't need to grind anymore but maybe that i don't necessarily need to be in that city to take advantage of it i think that's the thing uh so like for me like i spend just as much time if not more time in like london england or like barcelona do you know what I mean? Just because of the nature of like how we travel and how I like to hang out in other cities. So it's sort of like, oh yeah, at this point, I just need to live near like a major airport. And where what Halifax has a major airport? Oh heck yeah, doggy. <laughs> they got do they have a parking it's... spot for your bike there? Oh yeah, I haven't ridden my motorcycle. I own a truck. I moved out here and bought a pickup truck. So <laughs> You didn't have so to move that far to just to justify buying a truck, though. I mean, you can't live on the East Coast and not buy a pickup truck. Yeah, I guess so. Well, and you got this have... is like the this is like the capital of like Ford Rangers, and like I bought a Mazda B twenty three hundred. Okay, like a single, <laughs> like two seater, like it's just a dirt bike hauler. It's the best. It's I was just gonna say that's what I'm sure that's what you're using it for, right? Is you just put the bike it. in the back? It's and... so easy to load. I just like put my one bike on it. I can maybe carry two in a pinch. <laughs> it's great. Um, I, I am curious because I did read somewhere. I don't even remember where it was. It was a uh, maybe it was like Kerrang or something a couple of years ago. But you you spent time in Alberta growing up. You had family out here. That's uh, I read that that's how you got into dirt biking initially. 
Yeah. So originally, actually, again, my connection to Red Deer, my aunt and uncle and their two kids lived in Red Deer. Oh, my God. All right. Yeah. Did you know this? My, aunt used, to, my aunt used to teach at the college. Huh. Unbelievable. Like okay. Mathematics. So, yeah, when I learned to uh, to ride a dirt bike, it was like out on their farm. Um, and it was like this crazy, like two stroke that like totally ripped my arms off like it was the gnar- i was like i was like dirt bikes are so scared and then i was like oh no this like crazy 80s yamaha two stroke is just really scary i was like dirt bikes are actually really sick but yeah that's how i learned i was just like okay i've never Put ridden a bike before but you had you had some sort of incident is that what yeah, it is i had an incident as a kid that like probably on a very similar yamaha that scared the piss out of me and i never went back to bikes again i was probably like nine or ten and we were visiting some friends in bc and we had one of those bikes in a backyard it was a pretty big backyard but yeah. the guy was like oh just get on it and go for a rip just i'd never been on a bike before i had no idea what i was doing like 10 11 years old so anyways yeah. i got on this thing and i got going and the throttle stuck Oh, and okay. I'm in this I'm in this very small backyard and I had no idea what to do. So I managed to kind of do a little bit of a lap around the backyard, but then went straight through the fence uh, in, leading into the front yard. And it, there was about a six foot drop. And the bike just kept going. I flew off. And that's, I think, probably the last time I was on a bike. You never saw the bike again? <laughs> the bike was just. Yeah, there's a lot of it's funny. There's a lot of people who have like similar like 80s, 90s stories about like riding dirt bikes now it's like so like i have like a little like pit bike like uh, an 80 cc like pit bike that's so mild and i've like i taught my girlfriend last summer like i've taught tons of my friends on it and i'm like yeah this is what was missing in those early days i have a buddy but- that uh like two weeks ago actually just got his his bike license in rural ontario and i think he's looking for some sort of I don't know what bike he's looking for, but he, he works on a farm and he's just planning on using it to travel to and fro. Um, do you have any like, you know, first timer advice for a, a grown man trying out his first dirt bike? Uh, I think my my first time advice that I give to everyone is just buy any bike. OK, like literally buy any bike that works because your first bike, you're just going to drop it. You know, right. you're going to like crash it. You're going to like scratch it up not crash it but you know you're gonna do something stupid because you're not used to like being on it so it's just gonna fall at the gas station or it's gonna fall when you're parking it (laughs) so like better to buy like a thousand dollar bike that's like easy to pick up and it's like you know small and not be like man i'm gonna buy my fifteen thousand dollar like dream bike and then drop that and kind of feel stupid so i always tell people like yeah just go on kijiji and like buy a thousand dollar bike And there's like lots of them that are sick. And it's way, the thing that I always think of too, is that it's way more fun to ride a slow bike fast than it is to ride a fast bike slow. Mm -hmm. So like, if you're on this like slower bike, you're just like ripping around having a good time instead of being on like some thousand CC, like monster that you're only in first gear, you know? And if you were to pick, if you you mentioned earlier that you run this uh, clothing company, Treadwell, <clears throat> treadwellclothing.com. If you were to pick one thing from from your product line for a beginner dirt biker, like, well, say I wanted to give him a gift. I want to gift Steve a piece of Treadwell clothing. What What's that, that first starter piece? Oh, man, there's so many good pieces to choose from. <laughs> um. Honestly, the, the the most popular thing that people really like that I've made for the last like four or five years is I make basically like a like a vest, like a uh, kind of like a Carhartt work vest, mm-hmm. but it has specifically like deeper pockets so you won't lose your phone. Um, it's like got some stretch so you can wear it over top of a jacket. So it's like good for when you're like riding and you didn't realize it was as cold on a motorcycle as you thought. And also the whole back of the vest is like a giant pocket. Yeah, I so saw when that. You I, like, don't, I don't understand. How does that work? So it's, it's like, like a, a whole panel okay. that you have like access to through the sides. And because there's stretch on the side, you can like kind of fill it with some stuff and it'll, it'll hold more things for you. See, this just sounds like practical clothing for anyone. Like, do I have to have, you know, sat on a bike before to wear a treadwell? 
No, absolutely not. I'm not going to get like, you know, stairs or. Is it weird that I'm thinking with that back pocket, you could use it to like have arrows in and you could be riding your bike and then uh, be I mean, shooting arrows? arrows from the side. But yeah. People, yeah, people put tons of stuff in it. You can fill it full of beers. You can put hot dogs in it. You could put magazines, sweaters. Yeah. Wow, that's a jack of all trades jacket. I'm going to check that out. Uh, I also. But yeah, it's definitely. Nobody even knows what my clothing brand is. So no one would even call you a poser because <laughs> they don't know what it is. They just be like, that's sick, best, bro. <laughs> well, I do. I did kind of like, and I, I, I'm very eager to know did you come up with the dirt bikes? Is it an anagram? Is that what that's acronym? called? Acronym? Sorry, ac- acronym. Is that, um, is that you, uh, from, from Liam Cormier's brain? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, that's the thing with Treadwell is that I come up with everything. It's just a one-man show. Why isn't that? So that's not that a trend man. yet in in uh, the biking community as dirt bikes, uh, a.k.a. destroying institutionalized racism to build informed, knowledgeable, and empowered society? It's, I mean, it's catching on. That's it better be. <laughs> that shirt I did as a fundraiser uh, last year, and we sold like over we. I sold over like, I guess we with the greater people that bought them. But uh, yeah, we sold over like two hundred of those shirts. That's awesome. Yeah, I was stoked. I got some shopping to do. Um, we still have a couple of those left too. I like how I keep doing this. Like I'm like, don't even worry, brother, brother. And you get free <laughs> stickers if you order that best. It's free shipping in Canada too. Like you're already saving money. You just filmed a commercial. We gotta send yeah. this off to you for your own personal use. Right? Be there at Bose in your treadwell best. <laughs> You get a free shot of Sambuca. <laughs> wow, sold. I don't think AGLC is going to enjoy that free booze part, but whatever, we can work around that. What uh, what got you into clothes? Like, was there, you just weren't finding stuff in stores that worked for you and decided, fuck it, I'll make my own? Yeah, that. I mean, I definitely was like, because I'm the one who takes care of all the merch for Cancer Rats. Um, and it's always been something that I was like really interested in. Uh, like I've worked at skate shops and snowboard shops and stuff like my whole life. And yeah, I was just like, Oh, this would be cool to do like a brand, you know, now that I'm really into motorcycling. And then the clothing, like actual clothing, clothing part was like exactly what you said. Like felt like there was like a real gap. Like people were wearing Carhartt stuff or they were wearing like Levi's commuter you know, like some things that were sort of for bicycling and some stuff that was workwear. And I was like, you know what? I could make some cool stuff. Uh, And so through all the connections that I had from making Cancer Rats merch, I was just like, oh, maybe I'll like get into this kind of fashion-y world, which has been really like, it's been really fun. It's also been like really eye-opening because you think like, I don't know, like you know everything (laughs) and then you try and like design a functional piece of clothing and you're like oh that's why like people go to school for this i get it (laughs) so there's been like a huge like learning curve over the last five years uh and i feel like i'm still learning like i've got like some new stuff coming out and just like learning about materials and cuts and all this stuff is like ever evolving like i made a pant like i have a canvas pant and it's taken me pants are so hard (laughs) to fit the human body correctly uh so yeah it's just been like tons of learning and luckily though it's been successful and people like fit into whatever weird size things i make um luckily lots of metalheads are weird sizes so (laughs) (laughs) so wait you're telling me you can't just take like two halves of different pants and stitch them together and and then wear them there right (laughs) or you're just like yeah make these pants that'll be sick and then they're like oh but these pants like the pattern that you're using is for a different material so when you use 12 ounce canvas it actually doesn't fit the same way so you've just ruined the fit and wasted all this money and i'm like oh sick okay i'll i'll have to fix those then (laughs) so from a manufacturing standpoint then are you doing it all yourself like uh i don't sew everything so i do the designs and then i work with like a really great factory uh in shanghai okay um that i was like actually lucky enough to visit 
uh, while we were on tour. We played in Shanghai and I got to like meet everyone from the factory and like that's amazing. Um, yeah, it's it's been really sick. So so yeah, so I work with those folks and yeah, we've we kind of like now that we've been doing a lot of stuff together, we're like really nailing it. Like I feel like I send them a design. We kind of just like have that designy language. When I was first doing this, like I didn't even have like a soft tape measure, like a cloth tape measure. I was using like the, you know, like your tape measure that you do for woodworking. Like I was just like trying to like, I was just like, I would send them like measurements in inches and I'd just be like, I don't know. And they're like, okay, well, fashion, we work in centimeters. And I was like, oh, and then I went to like a fabric store and like bought like of cloth i was like okay i gotta do this but i do know how to sew like i could i could sew a sample um i learned how to sew when i was like a kid because my mom is the best she taught me how to sew and i used to make like my own like weird pants in high school and like make hoodies and stuff so i know how to do that stuff but not well enough that i could like make you guys cool stuff that you'd actually want to wear well that was, I, that was my next question i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna check out treadwell clothing and um I, uh, next time you guys are in town i want to see like 200 people minimum at the show wearing treadwell clothing i want I red mean, deer honestly red deer reps pretty hard like i did a i did a pop-up there a few years ago and like yeah i feel like there's like all the dusty tucker guys rep it like people at bows are always so like awesome so yeah honestly that you you might already know 200 people that have treadwell gear i'm late to the game but speaking of dusty tucker uh our producer ryan cooley is from dusty tucker and you've had some experiences with him over the years now months and months ago when we started kind of conceptualizing this podcast uh we used ryan as a test test subject and we talked to him for about an hour or so and learned a bit about his life and his experiences on the road ryan you got your mic set up Anyways, he was telling us about you yes, guys having him on or having them on tour, Dusty Tucker. Yeah. And as I remember, you was it night one, Ryan, that uh, Liam and the Cancer Bats kind of gave you an, a hard, important lesson? It was actually Scope. But uh, yeah, we were a little bit over over our heads and a little bit overexcited. What did I'm you guys do? Just, I don't even remember. I just remember you guys had like uh, logs on stage what yeah. <laughs> yeah we definitely had the stumps yeah i remember just like yeah, yeah. It was like i remember taking stumps. massive shit from scott and just being like yo guys like tighten it up you're lucky to be here and like don't fuck this up what good. uh it went I a long remember, ways honestly i you guys were fine in my books <laughs> you're too kind well the other Did drink a couple beers or something slow on like moving your gear off stage moving the stumps off stage uh yeah it's just like leaving like road cases and hallways and stuff like that and then this most current tour uh mikey went and bought beer and alex drank like all of them at the starlight room <laughs> sometimes those guys gotta let you know yeah it's true the road the i'm road usually bets. hanging out at merch honestly i'm just hanging out at merch i'm oblivious to a lot of those things that happen well, I, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad to know that uh, your your relationship, your working professional relationship with Ryan and Dusty Tucker, is is good. What about the story? Yeah, of, I'm down. I sing on the record. What about the story of how you guys uh, got some of those first gigs with the bat? Was it the bats that you'd said that they'd said, "Yeah, uh, you, you go ahead. You guys should come out on the road with us," and you guys used that as a "Yeah, we're opening for the bats." It's official. It's yeah, official. that was Joel. Well, yeah, because they. I think it was that you, Dusty Tucker, was like playing at least a couple of the shows. And then basically got themselves on the rest of the like Western Canadian tour. Because I think they said sick. that you said it was okay. That you got, that we're like oh, we're yeah. the official opening band of the bats. Yeah. And then the, all the promoters were just like, Oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that was like when we were out with three inches of blood and waster. Right. Or barn burner. Uh, first one we did was the bat Sabbath one. Because oh, it was just, it was two sets of you guys, and there was just like Joel's like, well, let's just sneak on that. There's no other. Oh, thing. yeah, that's right. That's right. Good times. Sorry, I'm getting my tours mixed up. Sorry. It's okay. You've been doing it for a while. <laughs> We've gigged. We've gigged. You got to get a little crafty when you're booking some of those shows. Like, do you remember uh, how was it getting gigs for the Cancer Bats when you guys first fired up? 
Uh, I mean, that was when we met B-Rad. So yeah, it was, we booked that tour, our Western Canadian tour, we booked ourselves. Um, and then, yeah, we didn't even have, well, we, we kind of had a booking agent, but we didn't yet. And then, yeah, we were like playing just anywhere we could. We played some sick house shows. We played like, yeah, we played like everywhere possible. Were you guys ever playing uh, like the the uh, Oakville YMCA or the the dojo in Oakville? Uh, we used to play the Y. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was our scene. So that that kind of side of things, like we were playing like um, all those Burlington shows, and yeah, we played like the Pine Room and all that kind of stuff out in Ontario. But yeah, there it's funny because like, well, uh, Ryan can tell you this. There's such like a uh, a thing like if you're from western canada it's so hard to crack like thunder bay you know onwards yeah and then vice versa it's like if you're from ontario you can like crush ontario most ontario bands will like go to you know montreal and then that's about it that's as far east as they'll go um we were lucky that we already had like a lot of contacts through scott's first band at the mercy of inspiration um, like they had toured the East Coast, they had toured with like Alexis on Fire out there uh, in the early days. So, yeah, so Scott already knew like tons of people uh, in the East Coast. So even when we were playing like some of our first first ever shows, like we had like ten minutes of music, um, we were playing like pretty sick shows, like out on the East Coast, like in Halifax. People were like, "Oh, it's the guy from like At the Mercy of Inspiration." Like, sick. Okay. There's probably like a hundred or so people at her first show. I was like, Sick. but then when we were coming out at West, I think because we were just jumping on like all these rad shows and there was tons of stuff that was already happening. I felt like the West coast, like Calgary had like, um, Nikola Tesla had just broken up, but it was when like glory nights and ghost cried murder and like all those like, kind of like cool metalcore bands were like happening it was like just as holly springs disaster was like starting like they we played shows with them on our like first and second tours in like the back of a hair salon Mm -hmm. you know like in saskatoon like it was just like anywhere we could play but there was there was definitely like a buzz for that kind of like hardcore that was happening so all those shows that we played were sick. I remember the Calgary show, there was like, not for us, we were like in the middle of the bill, but there was probably like 400 kids at like a, like a, I don't know, just like a hall, like a gymnasium that mm-hmm. they rented out. The but it was because the scene was like doing so good. And no, I feel like it was like, a, I don't know, it felt like a weird, like, yeah, just like where you would play like floor hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Some community and we played center. on the floor and there was like 400 kids. Yeah, the Calgary, I, I've only lived in Alberta for, well, it's been 10 years now, but I, I think I kind of showed up in Calgary near the end of like this huge punk scene. I'm not too familiar with it now, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty, pretty cool. I need to try and figure out what's going on with that. Would have been the Republic? Was the Republic a... No, no well, that... smaller shows than that, like okay, okay. Tubby Dog and a bunch of this just art spaces. This was even pre Tubby Dog, but yeah, yeah, like that whole... That whole kind of thing. Yeah, there was just like, I mean, Vern's. again, I, I feel like there was like lots of, there's always lots of good bands that are happening in Alberta. Totally, totally. But uh, yeah, we were, I felt like we were just like really lucky to kind of like show up and just like meet all these like really sick bands. Because it was when like, yeah, I felt like Misery Signals was like really killing it. Like Comeback Kid was like really doing mm-hmm. good. Means was still like touring. Like, there was just, like, tons of hardcore in, like, and it was, like, Alexis on Fire was putting out cool records. Under Oath was putting out cool records. Like, it was all when that kind of, like, summer was happening. So, it was, like, oh, you guys play hardcore? Sick. There's going to be, like, 200 kids at this Regina show. And we're, like, oh, okay. And then the the very next tour that we came, which was three months later, was uh, Alexis on Fire, Every Time I Die, Us, and Attack in Black. God damn. And, and that was of, just like a monster of a tour. What kind of venues were those that you were playing those shows? Like what? What? That would have been a time big frame. One, right? we were like, yeah, I was, I'm thinking that's got to be bigger venues, right? That was 2006. 
uh yeah. yeah so huge like that was like as alexis had just put out crisis mm-hmm. um so yeah like the edmonton show there was like four thousand kids yeah i feel like um, there was that stretch there where you guys probably right around that time but opened a lot with alexis and then jumped on with billy talent for a few tours yeah actually that that very next year because we met billy talent through the alexis guys um and they invited us on tour like in 2007 we started playing shows with them like we did like the yeah we played some crazy shows with those dudes just again because they're the nicest like alexis they're just like the punkest dudes they're like oh sick okay if we're gonna have like alexa on fire we should get cancer rats to open and we're like cool where are you guys playing they were like the 17,000 capacity yeah. outdoor venue in Toronto. And we're like, yeah. oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> Sick. That makes sense. And I, I'm like, now that we're kind of <clears throat> waxing about the history of hardcore and what it was like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, is there something, I know you haven't had a great taste of it in the last year and a half with the pandemic, but is there something that you miss about those days that you, you feel like isn't there anymore? Um, I don't know. Like, I definitely I don't know if there's like a point that I that I miss uh because I definitely think that there's still like I said there's still like really rad like stuff that's happening and there's you know there are a lot of like cool things that have kind of also changed you know in a lot of ways like I think it's cool that now there's you know an older crowd Mm -hmm. because before we were playing we were definitely like playing like you know the floor of a skate park yeah and like that's really rad and i'm glad i did it but it's also like i'm not like oh man i really wish was screaming through a pa that didn't work and losing my (laughs) voice that was the best (laughs) so older crowds the older generation stuck around i mean that's yeah that's that's the thing that i think is is the coolest part about that whole kind of like boom that happened in the 2000s is that now that everyone's like older I felt like there was a real point before that, that people stopped just like they turned 35 and they were like, Oh, I'm not punk anymore. Mm -hmm. And that now there's like such a shift and maybe just like a little bit more, you know, like people just being confident to being into what they want to. And like realizing that there isn't like an age cap on like having a good time with your friends. Yeah. (laughs) Cause everywhere else we would go, like we would go to England and they would have these like, incredible scenes and we go to europe and they have these incredible scenes and it's like there's like people like like a 10 year old with their like dad is at a show and they're both like super metal and you're like oh this is like generational this is like you've been going to see iron maiden with your dad forever you know and like your dad still wants to go to hardcore shows and like that kind of stuff is like i think what was missing in canada for a long time or maybe because the scene was like just small and it took, you know, bands like the used and Billy Talon and under oath and all that stuff to kind of just like make it a little bit more maybe normal. Mm-hmm. So the people are like, Oh yeah, I'd still go see Silverstein and come back in and like all these bands. Did you guys ever do warp tour? No, we did uh, the Rockstar energy drink taste of chaos music tour. That sounds like the kind of event you'd be able to ride your bike at, no? Uh, my motorcycle? <laughs> or a dirt bike? Yeah, there was, like, pit bikes. The Rockstar guys had these, like, little pit bikes. Right, right, right. Sick. We skated a lot on that tour. That tour was, uh, it was Thursday, Bring Me the Horizon. Uh, who else is on that? Four Years Strong, Us, Pierce the Veil. Yeah, it was a wild little tour. Man, I haven't heard the name for your strong in a long time. Thank you for that. Yeah, dude. Check them out. They're Those so harmonies. Cool. Those harmonies. They're the best dudes. There's Oh, are they, they they are they're good dudes? Yeah, they honestly that tour was so that was like the longest tour I've ever done. It was like 3 months ish. Like around like the US, it was just like so many shows in a row. It was crazy. Went everywhere. Went all across Canada too, but um, yeah, everyone on that tour was like the sweetest. Like it was like such a fun. Even though there was like points where we'd be playing, we're like, "Why are we on this tour?" (laughs) 
I got in trouble once because I used to I used to work at the Oakville YMCA. I was a lifeguard there for a few years, and you know, eventually I got control of the uh, PA system in the pool. And I was like, ah, four years strong is pretty. It's not too hard. It's not too heavy. <laughs> Toss that on in the pool while the old ladies are doing their Zumba and their laps, and did not did last they like much it? long. No, no, many complaints. They're like, here at the top of the world. <laughs> Oh shit. I had I was DJing a stampede party one year. Yeah. And it was uh it was just off the grounds, but I mean it's stampede themed. There was hardly anybody at this event. And it was at one of those video parties. And they had the the video for uh Slayer, Seasons in the Abyss, and like there's nobody around and it's in the afternoon. I'm like, fuck it, let's put on yeah, the organizer was not very uh, so a stampede impressive. party. It's a stampede party. You're just DJing. Straw You've bales. got video too. The videos there, straw All bales right. around everywhere. A few cowboys. Again, the place wasn't that busy. Yeah. Eh, what the hell? <laughs> Throw on some stuff. Honestly, slayer. you should have played System of a Down. Cowboys yeah. love chop right? suey. That's a really good point. Um, I was going to ask you, I was listening to another interview that you had done, and uh, you had started the sentence by saying that you and another buddy were at a Slayer show, and you left early. And then you went on to say something else, but I couldn't, for the life of me, figure out how you leave a Slayer show early. We left so we could go write the song Pray for Darkness. It was oh. Scott and I. Okay. We were oh, like, damn. We were like, oh, if we leave right now, we can still go jam. So let's go and jam. Because we were writing Hail Destroyer. That Inspiration is, took hold. That is dedication to the craft for sure. Yeah. And it was also kind of like, yeah, being really stoked. It was the um, Bleeding Through Marilyn Manson Slayer tour. And we had already, we had toured with Bleeding Through across Canada again. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so we hung out with Bleeding Through, watched a little bit of Marilyn Manson, and then we were watching Slayer, and they kind of knocked out a lot of the hits, like, early, and I was just like, this is sick, but we should be going jam and write Pray for Darkness, and then we went back to our jam space, and we wrote Pray for Darkness in, like, 30 minutes? Wow. No regrets. It was a good decision. That's also on that record, but <laughs> not that night. So but yeah, we had like two months to write that album. So I feel like part of it was kind of like, you know, can you being stoked? Can you go to a show and just be like fourteen year old Liam at a show and just go nuts or or? Uh, I mean, yeah. What do you mean, like, like still, like, like do... just forget that you're in a band and forget all of it. Like just to go to a show, get into the pit, uh, oh, and, yeah. and just go I mean, nuts I as as a fan. On the show. Like I definitely, man, when I went and saw Hatebreed doing all of like Satisfaction, I was I was like I have to get in the pit. I pitted so hard, and the best part was that when I got down there, I saw Andrew from Comeback Kid was like in the pit yeah. too, and I was like hell yeah, and I was like trying to like get on top of people and like get the mic. Um, but yeah, so I feel like there's times like that, like when you watch the Bronx, like man, you can't mm. not pit to the bronx but there are some moments like i definitely there's like a i don't know like some of those bands that maybe just want to watch and have fun more than like pitting to you know like i feel like when i see no effects now i'm like i'd rather i kind of just want to hang out and laugh at their jokes and just like watch the show i don't know if i want to pit you've done an, uh, a fair share of pitting in your life i, I can only imagine I have ripped a pit. Yeah, for sure. It's funny you mentioned uh, I was at. I, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't. It would make wouldn't make any sense if it wasn't true. But I'm pretty sure I saw Comeback Kid and the Chariot about ten years ago. It may have even been Comeback Kid was touring that record that you featured on. Um, I forget what it's called. Anyways, um, and I'm pretty sure I saw Andrew jump into the pit too for the Chariot. That was kind of a cool moment. Just like oh a yeah, clump. I'm sure the Chariot were pitting for. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. That's a good point. Those dudes pit. Steve is pits hard. <laughs> we should just make a you should you should make a podcast just like about pitting hard. Get a, you do like what Damien Abraham does with Turned Out a Punk, but you do instead of your I your like your, talk to people about pitting. Yeah, exactly. Um people always are like, you should do a podcast. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> I have a hard enough time like keeping up with my Instagram. Let alone like organizing things. I have too much. I have too much on my plate. Well, I, I, I was. Eat, I got I an was, emo DJ. 
can't be doing no podcasts. I was reading uh, a recent-ish interview with you where uh, something you said really resonated with me. I've always been a we'll figure it out guy, especially during times of stress. And uh, a lot of people in my life don't appreciate that. Some sometimes described as lazy uh, mentality. Uh, I don't think it's lazy. I just think, you know, we'll figure it out. Things will happen. You guys have kind of been living that through the last year and a half, haven't you? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. I feel like that's the nature of, of like being in a band is just, yeah, kind of rolling with the punches. Mm -hmm. Like plans are always going to change. Uh, things are always going to like maybe not go exactly as you thought it would. And it's all about being able to like kind of pivot and like roll with that. I feel like that's like why we've been able to continue being a band for like 15 years. Right. Just like, oh, okay, we're just going to do this. And then just like, yeah, keep it rolling. I don't know if that's lazy though. Maybe I, I don't think it's lazy, no. but I, you know, I've, there's been uh, arguments, disagreements, and it, it's life a, moments. It's a willingness to make mistakes. And like, I love everything you talked about. The clothing line was, oh, you don't do it that way. Oh, okay. Well, we'll do trial it by way. fire. Like, trial by fire. Like, why yeah. not? Yeah, well, make yeah. those mistakes and. Yeah, I think the the big thing for me too is that like in anything that I've done, I've always like really just like gambled on myself. Um, like with cancer bats, like I was like, okay, this is like a huge gamble, but I'm just going to like go all in and make sure it works. Mm -hmm. And then same with like the clothing brand. Like I was just like, okay, like all of the financial risk is mine. So when it comes to like selling any of these things or like making it work, like I just have to like hustle and like, I just have to make it work and kind of like where the pivot comes from. Like, you're just like, Oh, this didn't fit. Right okay, I got to find people that this does fit. And I got to like make that money back that I just spent making 400 of these vests so that I can fix that, you know, mistake on round two and hopefully like keep building this thing. And yeah, that's, that's kind of like the, I feel like the key to my success. And well, it seems like, like that shit doesn't stress you out at all. Like it, you don't get like this big panic attack down that, Oh, yeah, I think also because I'm not, like, super money motivated. Like, I like doing a lot of this stuff because it's, like, really fun. Um, and when it makes money, that, like, shows, like, you can't argue that something's successful when it makes money, you know? So I'm like, oh, sick. That's, like, proof of the thing. But usually I just, like, reinvest that money. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not like, oh, now I can buy like a BMW or like, I'm like wearing the same like free hoodie I got like, <laughs> like four <laughs> years ago, you know? And so th I think there's like part of that, that like maybe also is, is where like, yeah, my success isn't like hung up on like maybe some other like things. I don't know. Not to say like, I don't care about money. Cause it's obviously like, we live in a capitalist society and you have to have some mm -hmm. to be able to do things. But maybe on the flip side, I also know what it's like to have zero money and to still be fine. Like I definitely had like zero money at all. Like in those first few years when we were like starting cancer baths and it was like, yeah, that was still sick. I still had a blast. So. And how's the dynamic in the band? Is everybody else in the band similar to that as well? Everybody's a little pretty easy going or do you get some guys that are maybe yeah, a little I think, more? Yeah, I think everybody's like pretty, pretty on board with like what happens. I mean, Mikey and I, like our drummer Mike, he and I like handle all the business stuff. Um, and it's good to have somebody else too, who's like kind of like balanced and like wanting to, you know, provide for his like wife and two kids and like make sure and then maybe sometimes i'm kind of more the like chaos who's just like yeah let's do something nuts and he's like yeah and then let's also like make sure like it makes sense financially there's always got to be a voice of reason in there somewhere right yeah like he keeps it on the rails you know like i'll like crank it up to a thousand and he like makes sure that we stay on the rails that being said like and I, I don't know uh, what your other band members, uh, how, how they, what their lifestyle is, but you've been straight edged throughout the entirety of the Cancer Bats, right? Pretty much? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. 
you know, as as much of a wild card as as you may be, like, are there have there been times where you you've been the, uh, you know, the the cement of reason? Yeah, and I think like I'm also the one who kind of took care of all the business like forever. Right. Um, like I do all of our accounting, like that kind of stuff. Like I'm still, I'm still like kind of reasonable, but I feel like those ideas of just like, like a, a big example is just like for, let's say the first 10 years of the band, we just said yes to everything. Yeah. Like it was just like, oh yeah, like everything was a yes. And then we would just figure it out. And that, that's like more like that kind of energy to just be like, oh, yeah, and then we'll figure it out and that'll be sick. And not being like, oh, we should sit back and like maybe we'll crunch these numbers and like maybe we'll figure it out. I was just like, oh, we can tour with Rise Against like around Europe and the UK. Like, yes. Like, I'll just figure that out. Doesn't even matter. It's the title of that's the episode. What's that? It's the title of the episode. We'll figure it out. You, you've, you've made it already. Yeah, you just figure it out. <laughs> just say yes and then figure it out uh, and that then, is like, the... yeah as like time went on we were like uh, we should probably say no to a couple things <laughs> yeah that that has been the common theme yeah with so, many bands and, and what got show. you to that point because we have heard that a ton and almost every band we've had on said yeah we just said yes 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 but did you guys come to a point where you realized holy like we got to try to pace this a little bit yeah i think there's also the point where and this is like maybe going into more of a like a business idea is where you're always like pushing to like you know make your band bigger and to spread the message and to like play to more people and to do all this and then i feel like there's a certain point where you also need to like step back and like yeah figure out what like what you actually want to do or why you're even doing any of that um like that being said like for us like we are a hardcore band like we mm -hmm. love playing like crazy rowdy shows one of the things that like ends up happening sometimes when you play some of these like bigger shows is you're like, Oh, this is, this is like more disconnected, you know, in a lot of ways. And you're like, and in some ways, like we're not making as much money as we did when we were playing the smaller show, because now we have like more overhead and you have like more of these things. And you're like, Oh, if we kind of like scale some of these things back, and tour a little bit less like we're actually going to like make more money you know if we like figure out kind of like where you know we want to be and by that i mean like it doesn't always make sense to just be like doing support tours so we were like you know what we should just stop doing support tours because that's also not fun but it is part of this whole music you know uh culture you're like, oh, yeah, you open for the big band and then their fans think you're cool. Yeah. And you're like, ah. Not well, always. I think there's a, a big misconception there about people think it's, yeah, you get on this big bill and it's all glorious. But, I mean, really, the pay isn't that great. You're, from yeah. what I've heard, you, you're, you, with a lot of shows, you, uh, you're not selling as much merch because you have to have your merch price the same as the, as the headliners. Yeah, or, or you're like, uh, you're only limited to a few things. You know, so like the headliner can have as much as they want. Like you can only have like a couple. I mean, again, we were really lucky. So like when we did get some of those opportunities, like obviously going on tour with like Billy Talent and Alexis on Fire, like that's like a huge tour where that does work. Mm -hmm. Like those kids show up early and they, they're into every band. And we got tons of fans from those tours. But then there are the other ones where you're just like, oh yeah, like I don't think... You know, there was probably like two people at the like Bring Me the Horizon Thursday show who really like got into us. But like for us, yeah, it was just like kind of like looking at all those things and being like, oh, you know what? Like we should just do headline tours and we should like just focus on the places that like the shows are really good. Because I was like, we don't really need to play like Idaho again ever <laughs> i'm like actually nobody likes our band in the states i shouldn't say that people like our band in the states but our shows just like weren't as good like america's really big people are spread out so i was like we shouldn't tour in the states anymore where is like, your just... like where is the best spot in the states for for the cancer battle red like, deer <laughs> in the states yeah uh, 
the problem with the states is that like some of the really good places are like really far away yeah so like california is sick right uh but it's like 60 hours drive there or like we can play like a banging show in austin texas and then like an okay show in dallas and then like there maybe would be like 50 people at like an arizona show and then you can play some shows in california and you're like man i've just spent so much money like trying to get to these places whereas like we can go to england you can drive like two hours and play the sickest show ever Mm -hmm. and then drive another two hours and play another sick show i'm like oh maybe we'll just do this and there seems to be uh canadian bands seem to do fairly well like especially over in germany uh i think i know a lot of bands have gone over there and done really really well yeah, the, I mean, that's the thing. I think the the key is also just, like, paying attention to where things are working, you know? Not, like, what, you know... Obviously, like, if your band breaks in a place like the U.S., like, it's really successful. But, like, if it doesn't, why not just go to the place where it is working, you know? I feel like there's a lot of those, like, moments where I'm always like, but oh, wait, why are we doing this? People really like us in England. Let's just go to England. Like people really like us in Spain. Like I'd way rather hang out in Spain. Mm -hmm. Are you, uh, are you like going on tour and kind of splitting up from the band during tour to ride, like go full Neil Pert and and just ride your bike lone rider? Or is that an Uh, after before tour kind of thing? I would rather do it after and before. Right. Um, I mean, the upside to being Neil Pert is that you literally can just like ride your motorcycle on stage and like get on stage and then play drums and then not have to do anything. Uh, which like, again, that's so sick. I've, I've ridden to a couple shows. Like when we were in England, I was like riding around and uh, it's like really tiring. Right. So it was like, Oh, I, I could either like relax in the van and like drink coffee and like listen to music with my buds or I can like, fight this coastal wind <laughs> yeah like sure. a blast to the show i mean it, it's cool i'm glad i did it but uh yeah i didn't finish and was like oh man now i'm like really psyched to go like hang out at merch and like take a bunch of selfies <laughs> and, like rip a crazy sweaty gig and when you're in the writing process while riding a bike like how does you just have an amazing memory or are you constantly having to record notes or pull over and write something down I, I honestly believe that like the lyrics that you can remember are like actually mm. worth remembering. You know what I mean? So like if, if I'm like working on a song and like, I'm like very repetitive in like how I do a lot of that stuff. So even if I'm like lately, I've been just like driving in my truck cause it's pretty easy and my truck's awesome. So I like <laughs> drive around in that and like work on songs, but I still like that mindfulness. Like, you don't look at your phone. I'm not like, you know, I'm just like driving around like beautiful Nova Scotia. And like, I'm just like singing like the chorus, like over and over and over again to try and get, um, yeah, the like lyrics going. And my new thing too, is that like with the last, I would say since like DSOL, a little bit of bears, but DSOL was like the first record where I realized like I need to memorize all the lyrics before I go into the studio. Cause there's like a, a real different way in which you read lyrics while you're singing them. And oh, when you're damn. like singing, singing them, mm-hmm. like singing the shit out of them, like at a show. And I was like, okay, I need to like catch up to this and just have like lyrics memorized. Shit, I never and thought like about I'll that. Have notes to make sure I don't F it up, but. No, that's it's, uh, it's that's very a similar great tip. to you know we uh, I've worked in radio, uh, still work in radio, worked in radio, but same thing. You always you don't want to make it you want to seem like it's uh, natural and coming from the heart as opposed to reading the, those words yeah. off the page. Even if you have your you know if you script out what you're going to say, you got to make it come alive, and that's perfect. So then, yeah, I've been trying to like kind of almost write like that too. Like I want to like write lyrics that I I'm more inclined to like remember if that makes sense. So I'm are still you, like pen and paper, but I'm like more just being like, oh yeah, let's get it. Are you visualizing anything when you're, when you're in that writing process? Um, like, are like you on stage somewhere? Or yeah. Thinking about giving the mic. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sick angle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, I'm... What the fuck? <laughs> you know what I do though? Honestly, there's some points when I'm like writing lyrics and I, um, and I like will write something and I'm like, that's going to look sick on a t-shirt. Oh, hell yeah. What about there's like you... part of it when you're just like four words. You're like, right. Like, Go fuck yourself. Boom. T-shirt. Sick. Get it made. That's going to be a thick ass lyric. <laughs> Would you write like a call and answer? Like where you've got a line where, you know, oh, this is fucking perfect. The crowd's going to yell this back at me. Uh, no, but I do think about, you know, the experience now of having six albums worth of like lyrics. And there's like those moments where you're like, Oh, nobody knows what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Like I really like maybe made this too wordy and like people just want to sing the same thing. So I, I'm not, I'm not like, Oh, I should dumb this down to make it like really mosh ready. But I am like kind of taking some of those cues sometimes to be like, I don't need to change every little thing to like, feel like I'm really writing the shit out of the song, you know? I, like I there's still to... something to be said about it being like catchy for like every person to be able to sing along to it. I have to ask about the, did you get a chance to listen to the, the it's an EP, right? What you guys put out a few months ago. Oh yeah, the Volume separation one. session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, acoustic reimaginings, should we call yeah. it that? Yeah. Um, it sounds fucking awesome. Like it's really, oh, thanks, really good. Man. It's really good. Um, so what was? How was that born? Because I know, you know, it's it's nothing. It's it's a new sound, obviously, and it's not something you're committed to full time. But has that always been something that you've had in the back of your head? Like, oh, this song might sound pretty good stripped down. Uh, it came more out of like basically being in lockdown. Yeah. Um, and we had just put out like the, uh, repress of bears mares. Like mm -hmm. it was like the anniversary of bears mares, um, which is like our third album. We were like, Oh, we'll repress this to vinyl. Cause it never got a proper pressing, but because we couldn't play any of the shows and we couldn't do anything, we were like, well, maybe we'll do like a little fun acoustic thing and we'll just put it on Instagram. And also a lot of people are in lockdown. So we kind of felt like obligated or like compelled to like put a little bit more content like on the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, like our friends had been in like their apartments for two months in Italy. And I was just like, Ugh. so we started doing those videos and people were really stoked. Like they like, they got like a huge reaction. People thought they were funny. And yeah, I was just like, oh, we could we could do this because we're all in different cities. So it might not be as hard, you know, to like and originally we were just doing them like with with like video. So we would just like kind of edit two videos together to make the audio sound good. And then we we're like, oh, if we we're gonna put this out, we should actually like go into a studio. But it was funny because so I bought a house at the end of 2019. So when we were in lockdown, I was just doing renovations uh, by myself. Cause again, it was lockdown. So like no one could come and help me. Yeah. Um, so lots of days, like it took me like a really long time. Cause I'm not like a singer. I don't like, I like, I'm a screamer really like my voice has gotten like better over the last 15 years. And I, I wouldn't say I have like the worst voice, but I don't like naturally like those, those like songs. I wasn't just like, Oh, la 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 la. Yeah. Like it took me actually like, like Jay had to like play them in a different tuning. And like, we had to like really work on like the speed of everything. Cause I was like, man, I cannot like properly sing any of these songs that I'm normally just like, yeah, 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 yeah um so i was like doing renovations and i was like singing like in my house like just like by myself because i was like oh i can just be like drywalling and like singing like these acoustic things and then i would send videos of me like covered in plaster dust like singing a song and be like does this work like is this kind of like close to what we got uh so then by the time i went in the studio i'd like i'd just been singing them for like the last three months so I was like, oh, okay, I can nail this. So that's the story of why that sounds good. <laughs> I've always thought that's the telltale sign of a great song. When you can strip it down to kind of just some basics and still have it sound 
you know, you know, just as amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah. It almost makes me like really think there's something to, I mean, we'll never do this, but like if we'd just written those songs on acoustic guitars in the first place, Mm -hmm. we probably could have, you know, like maybe that's, there's like a songwriter kind of like hack in there somewhere. Do you know any like heavier bands that do that? There's got to be someone out there, right? Um, yeah, the only bands that I know that I've heard of doing that are like U2 and like Depeche Mode and stuff. The heaviest of them all. <laughs> you know, like the real, the real Metallicas of the pop world. Yeah. Uh, but no, I don't know any like any hard, I guess Rancid, but again, like I think all Rancid songs would sound good on an acoustic guitar. I know think... like, I know Lars writes a ton of stuff like on an acoustic guitar. You don't think Black Flag was ever just like a single acoustic guitar and some grunting on the side? Yeah, I, I feel like Greg Jinn was just like one take. He probably just like wrote that song. Yeah, that's in, like, in the studio. I'm curious, do you who who is your Black Flag uh front man? Do you have one above them all? Um You don't I, have to I say. I definitely like the damaged era of Rollins, mm-hmm. but I, and and like I like Slip It In, like I think that record's cool. But then he kind of loses me, like as it like goes, and I always am like, oh, that that I think is like kind of like an interesting part of the, you know, the black saga. Flag saga. But uh, I also really like Circle Jerks too, so. It's kind of like, yeah, I feel like there's a whole bunch of that all mixed in together. Um, Black Flag's cool, though. Yes. Get in the Van, man, I definitely, I remember reading Get in the Van while we were booking that tour. And I was like, all right, we got to do it. That would have been, that was <laughs> great, great reading material for that. You're like, you eat nothing? You just eat nothing? Okay, we can do that. Um. Well, I'm curious, uh, again, with the separation separation sessions, did you guys just do volume one so you could leave it a little open-ended just in case you want to come back to it in the, a decade from now? Yeah, I mean, we've been a little bit, because we obviously knew that uh, when we were making that EP that we were like, oh, like I had to finish like moving into my house. Yeah. So I was like, I can't, we got to cap this. We got to cap this at like X number of songs. And I thought the ones that we were like, we had a couple others that we were working on and it like wasn't going that well. And then we're like, let's just do an EP. Let's just put it out. And then we'll see what happens. And then again, people were really stoked. Like the response was like really great. It's great. That's awesome. Um, And it was just like, again, like a fun sort of thing to do. Like while we had all this time, but we have, I'll be honest with you. We have talked about some other tracks. See, once you get started. Now, would you work these into the live show at all? Would you do like in a little acoustic set during the show? Like, would that fit? No, I don't. I think that's the one thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, like, yeah. Kill the vibe a little bit. <laughs> Kills the vibe, yeah. I think it works if you like, if you can do like a cool, maybe like breather. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like in between. But uh, I think also we have so many like arrows in our quiver. Uh like if we're gonna do anything, we're gonna like rip Bass out, you know? Yeah. And like that's already what like people are like really gunning for. Do you know if anyone and if in the black need a breather, like we have like tons of like fun kind of like stoner songs that we can play? But I don't know. I, I feel like if there was kind of like where you know, like Mariachi El Bronx mm-hmm. like is kind of like its own separate thing, like I think if we could do some shows as like acoustic bats or i don't know what we would call it but what was, what was the other the other uh can the alternate cancer bats name when you guys were first starting out like it's a pneumonia, oh, pneumonia hawk or, hawk? Yeah, yeah 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 anyway we'll workshop some names um Cut-tustic, do you know if anyone do you know if anyone bats? sorry if anyone is in the black sabbath camp is aware of bat sabbath oh yeah we gave them like a lifetime achievement award wait uh, you did yeah yeah at at like an award ceremony in England. Oh, what? We like gave, yeah, we gave like Ozzy, Geezer, and um, Tony like this award. And it was because we do Bat Sabbath. 
what? And then we sure, had I had no idea. And we were like, sick tunes, bros. Thanks for saving metal. <laughs> Actually, t- Tony and Geezer were like the two coolest dudes in life ever. Like we all did a photo and like Ozzy had to go do stuff. And then Tony and Geezer like turned around and was like, so what's up guys? What's going on? And we're like, what? Nothing's going on. <laughs> that's un- that's unreal. When was that? How long ago? Uh, that was when they were doing all those like farewell. Right. So 2013, summer Holy 2013. Holy crap. That's awesome. Yeah. Did it. Touched them. Touched them all. Wow. Well, um, listen, we, we, we really appreciate you joining us, especially so late out on the East coast. You're our first East coast guest. Oh, sick. Yes. We, we nailed it. Um, Um, yeah, I was just chilling. We'd we'd love to have you grocery store sushi and Oh, hell yeah. Grocery store sushi on the East coast has got to, got to be pretty great. I'm, I'm assuming it, it is banging. Yeah. None of that three day fish. Oh yeah, no. So what's the plan? Have you guys? I just get the I just get the cucumber ones. Pretty have, easy. Have you guys got stuff planned? Any dates? Touring wise, uh, or are you just going mean, to work is, on writing? This and my, this is my thing that I'll say right now. <laughs> I feel like uh, I'm stoked that people are putting up dates. That's that's great. I we've also rescheduled so many shows that are still they've been like double rescheduled at this point i'm like ah, let's just chill <laughs> maybe let's just i don't know give it a beat see what happens see we'll what the world out. does figure it out but uh yeah so we don't we don't have anything like particularly scheduled and you're but, not like uh, you're not just sitting there like kind of vibrating a little bit ready to get out there and, and do it uh honestly can I be honest with you guys? Oh, shit. Yes, please. Yeah. Nothing but. I mean, I love playing shows, mm-hmm. but I'm also having like the sickest time. I'm like, like just like skateboarding and like hanging out with my girlfriend and riding dirt bikes and like, you know, building motorcycles and like having fun. I'm going to be honest. Wow. I- I'm not, I'm not like, I like, I'll rip the show when it happens, but I'm not like, no man, but I guess that's just not me. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. See you later doing that. I'm gonna go have like an amazing day skateboarding with my like rad art friends. Like, hey guys, see you. See you when I see you. Bye. You've got it sorted. You've got it sorted. I like it. Wow. Well, when you're uh, back in town, we'd love to show you this uh, this sick space that Ryan and uh, producer Riley have built here. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. It's Honestly, very cool. though, yeah, I will say I like more than anything. We've we've been so fortunate to make all of these like incredible connections and friends like all over you know the country, mm-hmm. and like the fact that we probably know you know like thirty or forty of like the nicest people in Red Deer, Alberta. You know what I mean? Not to mention like Calgary, Edmonton, mm-hmm. you know Vancouver, Winnipeg, Regina, Saskatoon, like that's that is the side that i like really miss is like seeing all those people but at this point i i kind of understand that like nobody is seeing anyone (laughs) yeah (laughs) so it kind of also makes it like yeah it's not just me so we'll just make the best of it and i'll see you when i see you hell yeah man i i like the sounds of that love it cool dude well thank you so much uh it's been a pleasure chatting with you yeah thanks for having me on the show this is really fun yeah. Anything, anything uh, any passing words there? Uh, Ryan, you want to say words, anything? Ryan? Hey, man, good to see you, and thanks for doing it. <laughs> hey Appreciate there, it. man. We'll Next time, I'm going to be... See you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, one more thing. Uh, anything you're listening to today, yesterday, tomorrow, that you might recommend? Oh, I'm on the I'm on the spot. Oh, man, that Gate Creeper ET, EP. Uh, Gate Creeper EP, the new Gate Creeper is sick. Oh, that turnstile EP that just came out like a few days ago. There's like a whole video that goes along with it. It's like a 10 minute music video. Okay. That is the sickest. Uh, yeah, those are good. Man, the new Red Fang is sick. Mm. That just came out. That is really banging. Um, I feel like I'm on the spot. 
I'm probably forgetting a lot of me. Yeah, you're killing you it. You did pretty well, it man. Pretty well. That's a pretty good. I got stuff. I, I got Red Fang, Gate Creeper, Turnstile, and then uh, Four Years Strong to listen to on my drive home. Oh yeah, bang some Four Years Strong. Too. It's been a long time. They'll be good. Oh, New Bronx, dude. Oh, I didn't know that. Bronx, Bronx just put out a new, like a single called Curb Feelers. Okay. That's. They put out a video for it too. It's very good. Uh, are you connected man, with those? Gojira is sick. Are you connected with those Haymaker dudes? Haymaker in Hamilton, I think. Oh, I uh, no, I don't. No? I don't okay. really know. I used to go to Haymaker shows in Mosh when I was like twenty years old. Okay. Um, but no. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a that's a good list to start from, and uh, yeah. Again, we'll we'll see you when you're out here, and hopefully, it's in the next. Uh, three years i'll try and think of some more bands for next time okay now you did pretty well Ready. yep well, Thanks, there's Leon. something i'm missing all oh, right you're guys good. thank you peace dude have a good night See you, man. Great. have a great night enjoy your evening ryan i love you bye well that was liam cormier what from the dude. cancer bats like just a dude chill just a dude just a dude uh really nice guy uh and our first guest from Halifax. We've covered a lot of ground here on the Rub stage. Well, time we got out east. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, I have regrettably never seen the Cancer Bats, despite listening to them for many, many years. And uh, that's that's going to change. I, I don't share the exact regret, but I did see them. They opened for Billy Talent here at the Centrium. Oh, you did? Okay. So it was a, I, I would love to see a smaller venue show yeah, yeah, yeah. for the full ferocity mm-hmm. of it. But even at the Centrium was was pretty nuts. Well, maybe we'll get them in the communal creative studios. And I'll, I'll also uh, check out his clothing brand, Treadwell Clothing. I'm actually I'm going to have to make an order now. That uh, jacket was sounds pretty. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm jacket do it. full. Just it's a vest. vest. Vest with some magical back yeah, pocket. Yeah, pocket sounds amazing. Um, Pete, what's up? You you got anything else before we go? No, we want uh, you to subscribe at the Bose. Bar and Stage YouTube channel. Subscribe, like. I was going to mention something that uh, we've never really discussed about promoting our podcast. And I don't know where our listeners or viewers listen to specifically. Okay. Um, but uh, if you listen on Apple or iTunes or whatever the hell it's called nowadays, give us a review. Preferably right. five stars. Sure. You don't even have to write the words. No. You just tap the stars. Just... just give us some stars. And does Spotify, you listen on Spotify, right? Yeah, Spotify does not have a, uh, a rating. Not All that right. I know of. All right. Well, yeah. So uh, uh, like, share, subscribe to the Bose Barn Stage YouTube channel. Check us out the road, the stage all over social media. Um, like Communal Creative Studios. Shout out to producers Ryan and Riley. And our, our guest Liam Cormier from the Cancer Bats slash Bat Sabbath slash a couple others. Um, I think that's it. Why is there no review system on Spotify? What's the deal with that? I don't know. They're posers. Hit the follow button. And we'll be back next Wednesday. 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 The Road the Stage is produced by Ryan Cooley and Riley Suryan, recorded in Red Deer, Alberta, and in partnership with Bose Bar and Stage, Troubled Monk, and Tourism Red Deer. The Road the Stage.